So as managers, we're going to need to figure out what kind of industry our firm is competing in. And so there's going to be structural factors that are market specific structural factors that are going to impact your managerial decisions. So market structure factors that impact managerial decisions. So the first one that we're going to have is simply the number of firms competing in an industry. If there's already a whole bunch of firms competing in the industry, then it's going to be difficult for you to make a ton of money. But if you are one of the new entrants, or if there is a under served market that's going to impact how aggressively you pursue that particular market in addition to the number of firms the relative size of the firms compared to one another and your own business which we know is the concentration industry concentration we're going to have some technology and cost constraints in addition if there's something going on like a recession or if it's like boom times, like post uh, World War II for some whatever reason, right? Then we're going to make our make decisions differently. So we're going to lump all those things, the booms and the busts, into demand conditions. If you build it, will they buy it, right? And then lastly, we talk about the ease of firm entry and exit and if these are familiar well they should be right these are things that are learned in survey of economics and uh, uh, microeconomics right so in order to determine if the uh, market is one of the four types of markets right we end up having four different types of markets that we study and we're not going to get to it this particular class, but we would we would normally get to it, where on the extreme side, where there's only one producer, and they could they they provide all of the goods or service. That's called a monopoly, right? Compared to the other extreme side, which is going to be a pure or perfect competition. So pure competition is when there's many many firms. There's free entry and exit. Um, there is uh, low uh, barriers to entry. There's there's free entry and exit of firms. There's free information between firms. So you know it doesn't really exist in real life. Almost all of the industries fall somewhere in between. What we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the type of industry that's closer to monopoly, which is called oligopoly, which is instead of you know, the, the, the rule of one or only one type is talking about many, many different firms, but still a high concentration of firms. There's a small number of firms that are competing. The firms are, are relatively large in size. There's high technological and cost conditions. Um, you know, demand conditions might be sensitive to uh, aggregate demand or effective demand. And there's relatively high barriers to entry uh, perhaps due to economies of scale, perhaps due to financial constraints, perhaps due to patents, technological constraints, so on and so forth. And then somewhere right here is what we call monopolistically competitive. 
And so this is most of the stuff that we purchase. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this today, right? In terms of, um, you know, apparel, concrete places, right? Um, those things have very low industry concentrations. And as a result, they would actually be more classified as a monopolistically competitive firm rather than an oligopoly firm or an oligopoly industry. So monopolistically competitive, there, there's some elements of the pure competition and some elements of the monopoly. So when you're in pure competition, you're a complete price taker. So this is, you're selling corn, you're selling wheat. Nobody cares that it's John's corn or John's wheat. It's a uniform product, right? Uh, compared to a monopoly, it's a very unique good. So this might be uh, insulin, right? The, you know, the, there's a monopoly on producing artificial insulin and you know, it's a highly inelastic good. It doesn't matter what happens to the price, you're gonna demand that good. They can, they can choose whatever price they want. Compared to in pure competition, if they try to charge a higher price, what's going to happen? They're going to lose all their consumers, right? It's a pure elastic demand curve. And so as we get further and further to the left on this spectrum, the demand curve becomes more inelastic until we get to a very inelastic demand curve when we are thinking about monopoly. So how do we actually measure industry concentration. Well, we need to measure the size distribution of firms within a specific industry. So we're going to be asking questions like, are there many small firms or are there only a few large firms. So we have two main measurements for industry concentration. Let's talk about them both right now. So the two measures that we use to gauge the degree in the concentration are as followed. So let's talk first about the four firm concentration ratio. So this is represented as C4 because it's the concentration, right, C of the four top firms. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the sales from the first top firm and we're going to add them up with the sales of the second top firm, the sales of the third top firm, and the sales of the fourth top firm. And then we're going to divide this whole thing by the sales of the total industry. And so as industries become more concentrated, C4 is going to increase. 
which means what? What's the flip side of this? As industries become less concentrated, C4 decreases. And we'll do an example here in a second for the concentration ratio. Our second main measure that we use is the Herfindahl Hirschman. Two guys came up with this together, right? Herfindahl Hirschman index. Also known as the HHI. And so this is going to be, instead of just looking at the top four, it's looking at all of the different industries. And like we learned in the quiz, it's going to scale them by 10,000. So it takes 10,000 and then it multiplies that by the summation of all of the individual market shares, all of the individual market shares of each of the companies that we have data on. And so it's going to look at it. So it's kind of like a least squares formula here. It squares the relative concentration of all of the different firms, not just the first four, and then it scales it by 10,000. So a couple of things to note about the herfindahl hirschdale index is that it places greater weight on firms with large market shares then does C4 as an industry measure. The HHI, it goes from zero to 10,000 and higher numbers indicate greater concentration. So we're asked a example for our four firm concentration ratio. So let's go ahead and take a look. So we're told that an industry is composed of six firms. Four firms have sales of $10 each. Two firms have sales of $5 each. What is the four firm concentration ratio for this industry? So I'll go ahead and give you guys a second to do some of those calculations on your own. So it's the four biggest firms. Biggest according to what? According to stock market valuation, according to number of employees, according to sales, according to revenue, which is good. That's all the information we have. 
We're only given information about the revenue of these six firms. So if we're asked for the four firm concentration ratio, we could think about it as the four biggest firm concentration ratio. There's kind of a hidden tacit word in there, right? Silent, silent hidden in the middle between f the four and the dash and the firm. All right, so let's go ahead and do this together. So what are our total industry sales? What's ST? Very good. Did we all get 50 for ST? The sales for the total industry. Did we all get that? Do you, do you think? Okay, so we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll solve that. Okay, so total industry sales... is going to be equal to the sales of the first firm plus the sales of the second firm plus the sales of the third firm plus the sales of the fourth firm plus the sales of the fifth firm plus the sales of the sixth firm. And so what are we told? We're told that four firms have sales of $10 each. So 10 is going to go into here, into here, into here, and into here. And then we're told two firms have sales of $5 each. So five is going to go right here and five is going to go right there. So we end up with total industry sales, ST, is equal to 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 5 plus 5. Is that clear? That's our total industry sales. So $50. Because we got four tens, so $40. 5 plus 5 is 10. 10 got $50, right? All right, and so we're asked, what is the C4? Well, the C4, I've already done a little bit for us, right? The C4, we know it's the sales of the four biggest firms divided by my total industry sales, ST. And so my four biggest firms are the ones that are selling at $10 each. So this is going to be 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10 divided by 50. So this is going to give us what? Four tens gives us 40. 40 divided by 50 gives us a industry concentration ratio of 0 0.8. So relatively concentrated. How would we talk about this in words? We would say that the four largest firms in the industry account for 80% of the total industry output. Well, any questions on how to calculate that? Just applying that formula that we got above there. Awesome, awesome. So, like most things in economics, right, uh, President Harry S. Truman uh, was 
quite famous for saying, I, I want a one-handed economist, because every time he would ask something, the economist would go, well, on one hand this, on the other hand that. <laughs> yes, what's that? Um, can we do a question with HHI? With the HHI? Sure, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I just need to know, so we do 10,000, because when I read, it said times the, so you take the, to, like, basically it would be like 50 times 50, is that what, so 10,000 times. We'll do one right now. We'll do one right So we're going to do demonstration problem 7-2. Thank you for asking. This is on page 210 of your text. And this is a HHI problem. All right, so we're told that an industry contains, consists of three firms. We've got two firms selling 10 bucks each. We've got one firm selling $30. We're asked, what is the HHI for this industry, and what is the C4 for this industry? And so, once again, we need our total uh, sales, because our HHI formula, it's going to be 10,000 times the sum of the squared weights. So let's go ahead and unpack this. So it's going to be 10,000 times square bracket the individual weight of the first one plus the individual weight of the second one plus the individual weight of the third one since there's only three industries here right and then each one of these is squared inside of the brackets now what are each one of these w's it's equal to my individual sales divided by the total sales, right? So we have to calculate our total sales again, okay? So what is our total sales? Our total sales are going to be equal to our S1 plus our S2 plus our S3. Our S1 and S2 are $10. Our S3 is $30. It's going to give us a 50 ST again. So each one of these things Is going to end up looking like this. So let's go ahead and just slowly start replacing things. Just because it's a third term doesn't mean it needs to be cubed, buddy. First sales are 10, second sales are 10, third sales are 30. So then from here, you can literally just put it into your calculator, put it into Google, and it ends up giving us 4,400 as our HHI. Now, what's the four firm concentration ratio? So it's gonna be equal to what? S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus S4 divided by ST, but wait, there is no S4, and wait a second, ST 
is equal to S1 plus S2 plus S3. So if I go ahead and substitute this ST into here, then I end up with S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus 0, because there's no S4, divided by S1 plus S2 plus S3. What does this end up equaling? 1. So the C4 concentration ratio is 1, because there's only three firms. So the four firm concentration ratio is 1. So I lied in my solutions to the Kahoot. It can never be zero, but it can be one. <laughs> so these measures, does that make sense? Yeah, okay, you. you're very welcome. So these measures are not perfect. There are some limitations that we have. So we'll gloss over them since they were already covered in the book. It talks about how we don't in, we don't count any kind of imported goods, right? So global markets are excluded, which is why our brewery uh, industry seems so concentrated because they're excluding all the Mexican beer, all the European beer, all the Japanese beer, all that kind of stuff, right? And so global markets are excluded. So what does this do? This overstates concentration ratios. The second one that we have is that uh, everything is treated like a national market. So it, even if your market is a regional or an industry market, or sorry, a regional or a local market, uh, it's treated as a national market. Um, and so the book gives this example of, you know, what if there was one gas station in each of the 50 states, right? And they each equally had the same amount of sales. Well, then the concentration ratio would actually be really, really low, but that wouldn't represent the reality of the person in the middle of nowhere, Texas, who can't drive 300 miles in any direction to find a gas station, right? And so by, by always looking at the forest and never looking at the different sections of the woods and, and the you know the different individual regional and local markets this ends up doing what this ends up understating concentration ratios in local or regional markets and then just like with elasticity, right, where we found that the narrower something is, the greater the elasticity is, the greater the response that consumers are going to have. Uh, different industry definitions and product classes when defined broadly understate concentration compared to more narrowly defined product classes. So the example that the book gives for this, a great example, it's about soda. <clears throat> so if we look at our table 7-2, we might be surprised that, uh, you know, since Coca-Cola and Pepsi dominate the market for cola, has a concentration ratio of 56%. Well, uh, it's based on a much more broadly defined notion of soft drinks. In fact, the Bureau of the Census defines the industry to include uh, any, uh, not any, but more, many more types of bottled and canned drinks than you might think of soda, like birch beer, root beer, Fruit drinks, remember Fruitopia, uh, ginger ale, iced tea, and lemonade. All of those things are bunched in with soda instead of just carbonated beverages. All right. Technology, the number one source of growth in an economy, and, and very important 
in running a business in any kind of industry, right? And so we know that industries differ with regards to the technologies used to produce goods and service. There might be labor intensive industries. So something that's relatively more labor uh, intensive is the beverage industry. They measure this by the fact that they use roughly 15 workers for each 5 million in sales compared to something that might be a capital industry like the petroleum refining industry which uses one employee for each 5 million in sales. So within a given industry, if the available technology is either the same, then what's going to happen is firms will have similar cost structures. And, you know, obviously, if it's different, then it's likely that one firm will have a cost advantage. So the Rothschild index measures the sensitivity to price of a product group as a whole relative to the sensitivity of the quantity demanded of a single firm to a change in its price. Change in the market price. And so our Rothschild index is just a capital R and it's given to us by the elasticity of the industry, the total market, how much the quantity demanded responds to price changes for the market as a whole, divided by the elasticity for the individual firm. So let's go ahead and do an example. Call it a day and a class and an eight weeks. So we're told that the industry elasticity of demand for airline travel two fifteen. We're told that the industry elasticity of demand for airline travel is 
negative 3. We're told that the individual, just had a stroke, elasticity of demand for a carrier is negative 4. What is the Rothschild index for the industry? Ending on a real thinker. So, we know that our elasticity for the industry is this negative 3, and the elasticity for the firm is this negative 4. So, a Rothschild industry just ends up being negative 3 divided by negative 4, which ends up being 0 0.75 positive. And so, what does this tell us? Well, since it's less than 1... It tells us that the elasticity, the firm level demand is more elastic than the market level demand. And so what does this suggest to me? Sorry. This suggests to me that I've got many substitutes within that industry. Real quick, we didn't get to it, but it's something that we should know. The FTC and the DOJ, they have these hor horizontal merger guidelines. And these merger guidelines essentially say that anything with an HHI of greater than 2,500 is a highly concentrated industry. And any time a merger increases HHI by more than 200, the DOJ and FTC will investigate. If the HHI is in between here and the increase from the merger is, you know, by 100 to 200, they may or may not investigate and intervene. So mergers can be good because they can increase efficiency in terms of R&D and economies of scale, but they can be bad since they eliminate competition. Think about WhatsApp, right? WhatsApp rose to popularity because it was this more privacy-focused, uh, you know, uh, free global connectivity software. And instead of Facebook uh, matching that and getting better and doing better about transparency and how they use their data and advertising and privacy and all this other kind of stuff, they just bought WhatsApp, right? They just bought their competitor out. So the FTC and the DOJ, uh, you know, does a public good by investigating and blocking mergers that happen in highly concentrated industries or industries that are uh, at threat to become highly concentrated.
All right, that's it. I'll go ahead. I'll throw this up on uh, YouTube for you guys. I will throw up the rest of the solutions to the midterm. Uh, we will. I'll see you in class here Wednesday, ten thirteen, from one to three, for the final. Um, can I take a